hide from it. We belong in it. Um, I, I just got a picture this week, and some of you probably know this sculpture. It's called Born Again. Have you ever seen it before? It's uh, a man, you know, with uh, like a black film being stripped off. I don't know how well you could see the picture or not. It's a sculpture uh, of an artist, and it's, it's a picture of somebody being born again because so many of us felt like when we became Christians that a film of dirt came off of us. Anybody have that testimony? When you got saved, you felt like the sin was like dirt on you and that God was giving you a shower. And all of a sudden, all of that defiling, sinful stuff that we were doing before we knew him, he came in. And then instead of seeing us tainted, now he sees us white. Remember how it says that in Isaiah? He sees us through the filter of the blood of Jesus. And instead of seeing the darkness of the sin, he sees us cleansed by the blood of the lamb. Aren't you happy about that? So that's the picture that I got, and it's kind of in conjunction with last week's picture, which, again, uh, Josh White was the one that first sent this to me. I don't know, do you remember that, Josh? When you, uh, you posted this somewhere on Facebook, and it's a picture of Jesus, like as if you had fallen in the water, and he's out on the dry, uh, maybe in a boat, leaning over and reaching his hand down to pull you up out of the water. Can you make it out from that picture? And that was last week, not last week, last time I spoke, which was two weeks ago. And I talked about this mystery of the kingdom of God is that no matter where we are as, as Christians, no matter how much Bible we know, no matter how experienced and how intimate our relationship is with God, we can still go higher. Anybody excited about that? That you never really run out of room to keep going higher in God because we're taking on his character. It says in the Bible that we're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. So this is kind of a part two. The first part of the picture I wanted you to see is no matter where you are, you know, because he said it to the disciples. The disciples were not really highly educated people. He had to speak in regular terms to them. He didn't pick people that all graduated from seminary that had all these advanced degrees. He picked regular blue collar people that were right from the, the regular culture. And, and that inspires me because he's not, he doesn't, make you interview in order to get into the kingdom and say, oh, no, sorry, you don't, you don't qualify. Isn't that cool? Everybody qualifies. And he's so brilliant, he could have taught Einstein physics, but he also would speak to a woman caught in adultery who deserved to be stoned to death and loved her enough to save her life and say, go and sin no more. Amen. Like, he loves us all. There's no scaling. He doesn't look at one person and think more highly of them than anybody else. He loves us all. That's so powerful to me. But it also is a wonderful thing about Christianity that no matter how much I study, I still stay curious because he shows me something new. The more I go after him, and you know, Bill Johnson was the one that said, the more you eat of Jesus, the hungrier you get. Where normally in the world, the more you eat, the more full you get, and you're not hungry. But with Jesus, it gets, you get even more hungry because you can see how great he is and how much there is to know. It's really unknowable completely. So this way we should look at our walk with him is that we're on this marathon run, not a sprint race, and that every day when we get up, we should have some disciplines. And the one I like is to see him reaching down every day and saying, I can take you higher today. Do you want to come up higher with me? And some days your flesh is saying, no, <laughs> I want the day off. Or I want to eat that cheesecake in, in the refrigerator. But the, the keto diet doesn't let you have that cheesecake, <laughs> see? And I'm happy that I started that diet a long time ago, too. And it's really been good because you don't even want it anymore. And that's the amazing thing. You're not even, you know, it, you, it loses its appeal. And this week, it's different. It's not the, the title last week was Understanding the Mystery of God, but the title he gave me this week was The Sin-Stripping Power of God. And I never heard anybody else say that, and I don't you know, know if it's going to be the most catchy thing, but it's the best way I could picture what he was showing me. And part of what happened when I married Tricia is I went from being mostly analytical brain thinking into having more visions. And she's very visionary. She's a seer. And when you marry somebody, you pick up their traits because what? Two, two become one. So I went from thinking more in numbers and logic into seeing pictures. And it's really helped me to understand what God is trying to say to me. So this is very different, right? So the first part is he's reaching down to pull me up. The second part is he's also stripping off that film of sin and dirt. Now, you can think of it at a high level of when you first got saved, you went from total darkness into the light of the Lord. And, you know, if you had died the next day, you'd have been in heaven, right? 
But are you different today than the day after you got saved? Well, yeah, why? Because you grew. You went from being on the milk to what? That's, this is all Bible language. You started eating meat. You didn't want just the milk anymore. We had a guy in the church that came out of a really rough background. He was a cop in Queens, and he had a problem with cursing. This is a common thing that when people first get saved, they don't even realize they're doing it because they have these habits. Excuse me, I'm still sweating here a little bit. <laughs> they have these habits that became so ingrained before they knew the Lord that they still do it after they're Christians, but they're trying to stop. You know what I'm talking about? There's a lot of things. I, I had a problem with rock and roll music. I was a Christian and I was saved, but I didn't realize the effect that that, that rock and roll music was having on me. So this guy was trying to stop cursing. And it was, it was hard for him because it was so ingrained in, in the way he lived. And he was, met, Trisha was mentoring him early in his walk and she hurt herself. Uh, we, I had some sheetrock in the garage and it tipped over on her and she was trying to stop it from falling on her and it broke her wrist. And this guy said, Trish, I just got to ask you, when that sheetrock was falling, did you, in your mind, were you, because I was the one that left the sheetrock out in the garage, was like, were you thinking that blankety blank husband of mine, I can't believe he left the sheetrock and I have a broken wrist now. And she went, no, actually, I, I didn't even think, it, think that. And he went, wow. <laughs> Because that seemed to him like the most amazing thing that somebody could get free. So that's that hand coming over by Jesus saying, I can help lift you out of this thing. And I'll make it easier for you that you won't even, not only will you not say it, you won't even think it. And that seemed like it was impossible to him. He thought the best he could ever do is just get enough discipline over his mouth. But we could apply this to a million different things of how sin still tries to grip the believer. Judging people could be one. You know, we all have a little uh, inner Archie Bunker that tries to rise up once in a while. And, and we, we hold things against a whole race of people without even realizing it. So no matter how long you've been serving the Lord, there's something else he can show you about how you can be more like him. Because we are being transformed into his image, not with decreasing glory, but with increasing glory. Okay, you get it? So just a quick rundown from last week. Uh, no, two weeks ago, sorry, because David did a great job last week, didn't he? And by the way, Megan is here with the baby in the front seat. David's on a 12-day journey. We'll be back Saturday? Wednesday. We'll be back Wednesday. And uh, yeah, so let's pray that they, get, they have a safe trip back, and I'm sure we'll hear great testimonies from our young people that have gone out to Montana. And uh, Megan's hanging in there for another week, or three, three or four more days. Um, so I tried to just cover this idea of why Jesus was such a brilliant like genius in the way he communicated with us because normally when you're in school, you, you have to go in a class with people that learn like you do. So graduate school is harder than high school, right? And harder than undergrad in college. And when the teacher knows that everybody in the room, let's say as a PhD student, the teacher can teach at one level, but if you were teaching eighth graders science versus PhD students, you would teach very differently, wouldn't you? But Jesus had a whole array of people, and yet he was able to deliver a message that everybody got some nourishment out of. That's his genius. And he would do it through stories. He would do it through parables. And I don't know if you remember, but I showed the picture of that guitar player, uh, that, that video of the guitar player that just like was effortless in the way he was playing because it was so ingrained in him, he didn't have to think about it. And that's how Jesus was with the Father. Like he could come up on any situation, and the Lord would give him a download for that moment. And I don't know if you believe it or not, but he wants to do that for you too. Like He wants Holy Spirit to be so alive and so alert, and he wants our relationship with Holy Spirit to be so fresh that we can trust the Lord no matter what situation. And you know, if you're in business especially, you can come up on some pretty hairy situations, right? Because the people in the world... They don't play by the same rules that we're trying to play by in the kingdom, right? Like anything goes, sucker punch, no problem. De defile you, no problem. Try to assassinate your character, no problem. That's in the rule book for them. So you better, like when you get up in the morning, say, Lord, lead me not into temptation, right? Like don't let me go down that road to fight that kind of fire with that fire because if you live by the sword, you're going to what? No, we're going to die. I'm not dying by the sword. 
when I get in that business situation, I'm not going to take on the way the world operates because I work on a different level than they do. I work in a different kingdom. My thought process comes from the Lord, and there's so much more wisdom in here than what the world tries to feed us, right? So I talked about that mystery is that no matter who you are in the Lord, no matter how long you've been saved, you can still go further in God. You can still grow. Uh, you can be fluent with your interaction with the Holy Spirit so that when you come into a situation, the Lord will give you what to say right in that situation. It takes a lot of courage to live like that because our typical response is knee-jerk reaction. Somebody says something, and but the Bible says, you know, and that's good. It's good to say what the Bible says, but is this what the Lord has given you in that moment? I want to live like that. I want to be ready. And then you remember scaffolding? Because Lisa kind of had it in the Word today. I used that example of how Jesus would teach. He was able to, like, scope you out and find out where you were and give you exactly what you needed to move you higher to the next situation. And he did that with everybody. Sometimes all at once with a whole crowd, he could tell one story and every person would move higher. And, and the Lord is just so good at that. I'm, I'm trying to encourage you to live like this and keep asking him for that. And then... Uh, we, if you don't do that, I, I tried to warn you about the dangers of religion and that the Pharisees, Jesus said to them, the prostitutes and tax collectors are entering into the kingdom before you. That should really scare us because that's the danger of religion is that you think you've already read the Bible through several times. You know, you have your Bible reading program and there's nothing wrong with that. The religious version of it, though, is that you're just doing it to earn points with God that you're not going into the word when you read it and saying, Lord, show me something new today. I want it to be a vibrant relationship with you. I want you to speak to me. We posted a little clip of a video by Bill Johnson and the title of it is, Read Until He Speaks. And uh, his, he just said his personal discipline is he gets in the morning, he opens up the book and he doesn't leave his time with the Lord until he hears the Lord speak to him through the word. That's a good discipline, don't you think? You can say, well, you know, he's a pastor. He could be full-time. He has plenty more time than I do. But it's still a good discipline to say, I'm not, I'm not getting up from this table until the Lord speaks to me through his word. And he will, because he won't cut short your expectation if you read it expectantly and not just because you're bored. And they got bored. You know, the religious people got bored, and they got hung up on their power trip, and they lost their relationship. So the very people that Jesus wanted them to reach, they were looking down upon. They were ignoring, and Jesus was reaching them. And he's saying, look, they're getting into the kingdom before you are. So that's a warning for all of us, that we can become too lethargic. We can lose the spark of our relationship with the Lord. It can become too mechanical. And you know what rigor mortis is? It's the stiffening that happens when a body dies and, and rigor mortis sets in. Well, that's a religious condition too. And you start to recognize when people start saying, well, we've never done it that way here before. <laughs> If you serve the Lord, he's going to be asking you to do a lot of things that you've never done that way before. That's the power of the Holy Spirit is he comes up with new things in the moment. And, and the examples that we have to use today, the world that we live in today, just different from when I was a kid. Anybody even remember what the Dewey Decimal System is? I got a hand up in the back. For those of you that don't know... When we had to do a report, we'd have to go to the library, and if we had to find a book in the library, we went to this index, like a big rack of drawers of index cards, and we had to look at the code that told us where the book was and go down that aisle, and it took a half hour to find the book. Today, they just Google it on their phone, and you know they're done with the answer before we even found the book. It's a very different world, scary world. Kids aren't asking their parents for their opinion. They're asking Google for the answers. That's not good because Google ain't going to give an answer the Christian parent is going to give. So you stay engaged with them, and you, you keep knowing what's going on in their lives, and you keep asking the Lord, give me a fresh way to communicate this truth for today because what worked 60 years ago isn't going to work the same way today. When um, William Booth had the Salvation Army, he, he set up a, a band, a marching band, and they would march through the streets of London, and a crowd would follow the band, and he would set up a, uh, a, I don't know, some kind of stand, and he would preach. You set up a marching band today in New York City, you get arrested, right? Or people wouldn't even bother to 
bother to follow you. The, the truth of the word doesn't change, but the method that we use to convey it has to stay fresh and stay current. And nobody's better at keeping it fresh than Jesus. Amen? So what are we saying this week? Part two. I'm going to say it's a part two. Because he pulls me higher. And pulling me higher should result in some kind of change in my behavior. Let's just say men just really struggle with pornography, right? We know this is a problem. There's so much shame attached to it that nobody wants to admit it. And it's got a grip. It's got a power. It's, it's a big part of the enemy's plan to, to try to keep people in the gutter and to keep them out of the holiness and keep them walking in shame. So it's got a power, but whose power is greater? God's power is way greater than the power of pornography. He has the ability to break that stronghold in somebody's life and, and completely remove it, where they have no desire to do it. You believe that? All right, so that's all. You can act that a little Pentecostal. You could say that that's true, because it's true. There's no problem that the enemy tries to throw at us that God's power can't strip it off us. And that's what I love about the picture of this guy. Just this, he, The weight was underneath all along, and he's just stripping off this black film that was on him. But if you think about the power, and, and really any power that we can think of usually has some kind of heat source related to it, right? The combustion engine in your car. It's combustion. There's a fire that burns something on the inside. When, when the Holy Spirit fell in the second chapter of Acts, what did they see over the heads of the disciples? Tongues of fire. When God set up the tabernacle in the wilderness, what was on top of the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies? The mercy seat, and there was fire on the mercy seat, right? So there's all this connection. We're told in the New Testament that we're going to be baptized with fire. So what about the sin that's living in there is in con contradiction to the fire of God that's living on the inside. Who's going to win? Well, if you submit yourself to the Lord, he'll burn that thing off. And all the dross and stuff that doesn't belong in there, if you yield yourself to him and say, Lord, I hate that thing so much, I'll do whatever it takes to walk away from that forever. I don't ever want to look at that stuff again. It's so defiling, not just to you, but to the people in your lives. And you might not even fully realize it. Same with cursing, right? It's defiling. It's a sin to curse, the Bible says. But in our culture, it's just some kind of show of manhood or womanhood. I don't know, because the women drop F-bombs in the workforce as much as the men do. In my, where I work anyway. So look, you know, I'm not going to have to fall victim to that. I don't have to be defiled by that. He's stripping the sin away from me as I submit to him. And we don't get to a point where there's not still something in there that could still be stripped off. As soon as you think you've arrived, then pride would have to be stripped off. <laughs> so, say la. So I put these three things down. God strips sin of its power. None of Satan's strategies can win. And I just love that one. I'm going to probably repeat it a few times today. Satan has strategies. And if we're slumbering, if our spirits are slumbering, his strategy will win because we're not alert. We're not that alert watchman on the wall. And Satan has these strategies that are going after you. How many times have you been driving in your car and the radio's on and it's just kind of playing in the background? And if somebody asked you what was on for the last five minutes, you have no idea, <laughs> right? Five commercials were on, and you didn't even know it. But your, your brain is so powerful that it was still going in there, and it was still influencing you. What if it was worship that was on in the background instead of the radio? That would have still been going in, too. And that would have strengthened your immune system instead of making you want to buy some kind of uh, you know knife deal on some <laughs> crazy commercial you see at two o'clock in the morning, right? Because your spirit's alert, but your conscious is not always aware of what's coming in. Ah, so his strategy's there. He's going to try to use a strategy against you, but I love it. It says, none of Satan's strategies can win. And then I put, our decisions are tested in fire. All right, so you with me? You ready to go on a little journey? Try not to take too long. These are the three points I'm going to try to make. Just three. That shouldn't take too long. God strips sin of its power. None of Satan's strategies can win, and our decisions are tested in fire. So we're going to just look at some scripture, okay? This is the first one, Philippians chapter 1. And when I say hold it up to the fire, I'm sure some of you have heard this analogy. But back in the day of the Bible, uh, when the Bible was written, people were still making pottery. And especially in the Old Testament, we're told that, you know, we are the clay, and he is the potter, and put us on the wheel, Lord. And that's a, that's a whole message in itself. 
let, you know, Lord, shape me into this vessel of honor in your house that I can carry your glory. But what would happen when they would have a crack in the pot? They would put wax on it and they would try to cover it up. But if you were a wise buyer, one of the first things you did when you went to, to buy it is you would bring that pot and put it near the fire. And you would test it with fire because if there was any wax in there, what would happen? It would melt. Pretty smart, right? Because it has to get fired up in the kiln when you first make it. But if you try to put wax in there, boy, that'll apply on a lot of things, right? Where we try to take shortcuts and we put wax over things instead of getting to the real root of the issue. It works in the short run, or at least we think it works in the short run. Lies are like that, right? You tell one, oh, you know, it looks like I got away with it. Tell 50, you can't remember all the lies. Big problem, but the devil tries to make you think it's working. And like, God, oh, yeah, don't worry. I know God said, thou shalt not lie, but you can get away with it. Well, okay, you could try it if you want, but we've learned the hard way that doesn't work. Better just be honest right up front. Those shortcuts are not shortcuts, amen? So what does this say? Philippians 1, hold it up to the fire. This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in discernment, all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent. Now, I don't know about you, but approve the things that are excellent really didn't resonate too much with me. Like approving something just didn't sink in with me. So I looked in other versions, and I found this one that made more sense to me. It says, so that you may be able to test and prove what is best. So what's he saying? I'm praying that your love will abound more and that you'll get knowledge and discernment so you can test things. All right? If you remember, I said the number three point I was making today is that we test our decisions in the fire. So you see what he's saying? I want you to have more knowledge and discernment so that you know that every decision you make matters. They look small, but they're not because your whole life is really just an accumulation of all the decisions that you've made. Like, we heard a testimony of somebody that lost almost 100 pounds. And it's been a while that, that you've kept it off, right? How long has it been? Two years. That's, you know, because losing the weight's one thing, but keeping it off is really the hard part, isn't it? I'm really unhealthy if you don't keep it off because then your body just keeps going up and down. So think of all the decisions she had to make to change her lifestyle, to change the way she was eating, to lose 100 pounds and her husband. And it's a good example because I guess most of us at some point in our lives have struggled with food, right? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And maybe still are. But is, is God still reaching his hand down and saying, I could, I could pull you higher? And one of the fruits of the Spirit is temperance, which is also self-control. So I have every biblical right to stand on it and say, Lord, this is your promise to me that you'll give me self-control in this area. Now, just because keto worked for her doesn't mean it's going to fit your personality, your temperament, but something out there will. I'm only using this as an example. There's so many other things. It's just that because Christians, a lot of times, like, I don't drink as, as, a, as a matter of my discipline is. I decided not to ever drink alcohol again. I don't think it's a sin to have a glass of wine, but I know it's a sin in the Bible to be drunk. So my math is pretty easy. If I never have the first one, I can't have the tenth one. I live there. I know what that was like. So I don't miss it. It's not a big deal to me. Other people could think that's legalistic. Fine. Think whatever you want. I don't want it. I don't miss it. I met my quota in ten years. I had all the drinking I needed to do from the age of 15 to 25. I drank enough alcohol to cover the whole lifespan. So that was my decision. Not, that doesn't have to be everybody's decision. But you should have some discipline in your life. And, and around food, it's legal. See, it's legal. We have to do it. It's not a sin. It's only a sin to be gluttonous. But it doesn't feel gluttonous when you're just having that extra thing whatever that thing is, but somehow she, she shifted herself. I gotta believe the Lord helped. Without the Lord's help, you can't do it. But if you say, look, I need help in this area. I don't wanna keep struggling. And I love what she said is that I can, my husband and I were not healthy, but now we're healthier so we can do the work of the Lord. We're more able to do what he's calling us to do because we steward our body in such a way. Now I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anybody here because these battles are real. And, you know, like once you can get over some of the shame of it and you realize who you are in Christ, you don't want to go do that thing anymore because you have a better understanding of who you really are. 
All right, so I want to take every decision and bring it to the fire. <laughs> I want to see if there's any wax in my decisions, right? If you think back on your life and all the decisions you made and you didn't put enough time and effort into it and you just said, oh, this isn't that big a deal. It can't come back to hurt me. What can go wrong? Oh, the devil's great at those, isn't he? He just dupes you into thinking it's not as big a deal as it really is. But if every decision, if we had that discipline to say, Lord, is this you? This thing that uh, this person is proposing to me, is this you? Let me hold it up to your fire in prayer. And when the fire comes, you see where the wax melts off. And that's a download. And the Lord's given you a strategy on how you're supposed to live your life. Something important like what person to marry. <laughs> Any wax in there? <laughs> All right. Selah. <laughs> Here's the next part. It's from John 1. I think it might be one of the most well-read chapters in the Bible because most people, if I took a poll here, when you first got saved, what did they tell you to read first? The Gospel of John. So where did you start? Chapter 1. So this is probably one of the most well-read scriptures ever just on as, as far as the number of times it's been read. And you can still find something new in it. Isn't that amazing? I did this week. I found something new. It says what we probably are all familiar with. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is with God, and the Word was God. So who's the Word in that scenario? Jesus. And that's a new concept to a lot of people. We think back to Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. And now John is starting the new gospel in the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word. So in the beginning, God. Again, see, John's pointing you back and saying this is the new version of Genesis. Hmm. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And here's what I want to focus on. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Who's that? Jesus came in the midst of the darkness and shined a light just by the way he lived his life. And he's the light of the world. And then he said that we, in the Sermon on the Mount, we are the light of the world. And light belongs in darkness. So we live in a part of the country where there's a lot of darkness, right? I mean, I guess in most parts of the country there is. It's just very in your face around here, especially if you cross the Hudson River and get into New York City. It's really in your face. Well, but we should be intimidated by that. The light in us is brighter than the darkness. God's power strips away the sin. That fire comes up on the inside, acts like a furnace, and whatever film of dirt is on there, it just melts off because it can't stand the heat. Hmm. That's how I want to live. In him was life, and the light was the life of, uh, sorry, the life was the light of men. And this was the hard part for me that I picked up something this week. It says, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That's the New King James Version, which is what I tend to read as kind of my standard. The light did not comprehend, I'm sorry, the darkness did not comprehend it. You know, when you think comprehend, it's more like me trying to understand quantum physics. Didn't comprehend it, couldn't understand it. And it's really, the word, it's, there's so much more to this word than that. It's not that the light just couldn't understand it, because you know a lot of people that aren't Christians right now, you present the gospel, and they're like, I'm sure, I'm glad it works for you, but I don't get it. True? You run into that? Well, you have to ask the Lord for a new strategy. What's the key to that person's heart? What do they need to hear that will open up their eyes? So look at the next one. It's, I, I went and looked at other versions and how this word gets interpreted, comprehend. There's only one version, but there's many others. What came, this was from the Message Bible. It says, what came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. Isn't that good? I can go to Jesus every day and let him be my light that day. The life light blazed out of the darkness. Look at this. The darkness couldn't put it out. That's a whole lot different than could not comprehend it. That turns it into a fight now. Now it's a fight between light and darkness, and the darkness loses. Look at all these other ones. Darkness could not overcome it in the NIV. Darkness can never extinguish it in the New Living Translation. And then there's others that say could not comprehend it. But then, I like that one, darkness never put it out. Apprehended it not, right? The darkness is trying to chase down this light but can't catch it. That's Jesus. Has not overpowered it. And then I just came up with the street version. Couldn't crack the code. The darkness cannot crack the code of Jesus. He's way higher. And then we'll never devise a strategy to defeat it. 
The devil will never devise a strategy to defeat it. God is greater. His power strips sin. It strips sin if you submit yourself to it. Now, that's, that's the process. Submitting yourself to it means you've got to say goodbye to some old habits. Those people, remember when Jesus cast out the demoniac, their pigs ran into the lake. They lost their pigs. They weren't happy. They told Jesus to leave. We don't like to lose our pigs sometimes, right? But man, I got a whole new understanding of this verse. Like now all of a sudden the darkness is not going to defeat the light. There are times when somebody overdoses on drugs and dies, right? And it looks like the darkness won. But if that person had submitted themselves to the Lordship of Jesus, had surrendered themselves, had allowed God to strip the sin, and what's the sin there, right? It's an addiction. You're, you've allowed something to control your life. And if you look at your life, if there's something you can't stop, that's a problem. There should be nothing in your, I mean, keep reading the word. That's one good thing that you shouldn't be able to stop. But I'm saying like coffee. If you can't stop drinking coffee, that's a problem. You should be able to take a week off of anything you're doing in those regards, watching stuff, playing video games. But if you took some people's phone away for a week, I think they would be in post-traumatic stress. I can't believe how many people are playing video games on the subway, on, on their phone. And this thing could be like a, a college education of stuff that's on here if you wanted it. So it's not this is, isn't bad. It's how people use it, good or bad, right? So. Let's, let's keep going. I don't want to keep you here all day. I probably could, but I won't. <laughs> so then in Hebrews, this gives us a connection to who it is that is this life light that's blazing in the darkness. And this is the Passion Translation, which I know you know that we quote a lot because we love it. It says, For we have a magnificent king priest, Jesus Christ, son of God, who rose into the heavenly realm for us. And now what? Sympathizes. Do you see it? Oh, I didn't change it. I'm sorry. My bad. I'll, I'll catch up with y'all. <laughs> See that yellow one? Now sympathizes with us in our weakness, in our frailty. So I think if he's leaning over and holding his hand out to me, he's not calling me a loser. He's not saying, oh, man, I can't believe you're calling me again. <laughs> you need my help again? <laughs> well, would you say that to your child? No, you're like, that's what you want to do. You love your child. You want to help them. You're glad when they ask you a question. As they get older, they stop asking sometimes. And you want them to stay connected with you, right? So he's not looking down at us. It says, we have a magnificent king priest. He rose into the heavenly realm. We were singing about it during worship today. Ascend the hill of the Lord, right? Go higher up that scaffolding that Lisa saw. And now all of a sudden, he sympathizes with us in that frailty. He's not putting you down for asking for help. He wants to help you. He understands humanity. For as a man, our magnificent king priest was tempted in every way just as we are. And what did he do? Louder. One more time. You should put your foot down when you say that. He conquered sin. This is the battle that we're all facing. If you could get sin conquered in your life, things would change dramatically. Because these are the things that besetting sin that hold us back. We've got this dual track running in our lives where these addictions are holding us back or whatever that, whatever that besetting sin is. It could be arrogance. It could be pride. I heard somebody call arrogance like a coating of arrogance. And you can picture that on the Pharisees, can't you? And then Paul, he's all, you know, before he got converted, he was called Saul. He's on the road to Damascus to go kill Christians. And all of a sudden, that coating of arrogance, when the light was shining, yeah, it burned it off, didn't it? He couldn't even see. It was so bright, he couldn't even see. And now that coating of arrogance became humility. And now he's blind and has to wait for somebody to come and pray for him until he can see again, yeah. right? So that could be any of us in any area. We could be getting too haughty or too prideful. And it's funny, you could be working well in 99 areas in your life. But if there's one area, he's like, come on, I'll help you higher. Come up a little higher. I'll strip that sin off you. I'll turn up the heat, and it'll burn that film off, and you'll come up higher. And you know what? You won't go back. You're not going to want to go back. Because once you've tasted the real thing, man, you don't want the fake. All right, I'm, I'm moving along here. When Jesus, oh, this is at the end of the gospel, and he's coming into Jerusalem in Luke 19. It says, when he caught sight of the city, he burst into tears with uncontrollable weeping over Jerusalem, saying, if only you could recognize that this day, that this day, peace, it's within your reach. 
I'm trying. Look up. Stick your hand out. Peace is within reach, but you're not seeing it. Because what? They just rejected him. He didn't come in a form that they expected. And that's what religion does. It puts God in a little box. And if he doesn't fit in this little box, we've never done it that way before. But look, he comes in different dimensions, in different ways to different people. You have to stay open. Now, don't be fooled, right? Because there are deceiving spirits out there. You have to have discernment. But be open that he's so creative. He can give you a different way to solve a problem that you weren't thinking about. Peace is within your reach. And I'm, I'm going to read it because it's pretty sobering. It says, but you can't see it. The day is soon coming when your enemies will surround you, pressing you in on every side, laying siege to you. They will crush you to pieces. Now, let me just back up for a second. That's what it felt like to be addicted. I mean, you were a slave to the addiction. I'm talking of my own addiction to drugs now, okay? When you didn't have that drug, you stopped doing everything else, and you spent all your time working on where you were going to get the next fix, chasing it picking up again, however you describe it. It takes over your life to the point where you're digging through ashtrays to find little roaches of joints These, you know, when you smoke pot. And you would take these little roaches, that little end of the thing, and you would try to find five or six of them, and that would turn into one new one. I mean, you talk about defiling yourself. Digging through ashtrays? Really, this is the son of a king is going to do this? No the son of a slave. And that's what you are. You're a slave to the addiction. And you do all these things. And look, there's a day coming where there's going to be judgment. You can't just keep living in that open-ended sin without expecting some consequence. You drink alcohol for 50 years, it's going to affect your liver. Right? Now, God could heal it. I'm not saying he can't. But without that peace, you destroy your own body. Now, I know he renews brain cells when you get saved because he renewed a bunch of mine. Because like I said, I did a whole life's quota in 10 years of alcohol. And if alcohol killed brain cells, I wouldn't even be able to play the guitar anymore with all the brain cells I killed. So he definitely can heal it. But if the person doesn't get off the track, it's not getting better on its own. Their willpower isn't going to work. But the devil tricks them into thinking that. And that's, this is it. On the day is soon coming. If I had stayed on the track I was on, when my enemy was going to surround me, pressing me in on every side and laying siege to me, crushing me to pieces. That's what would have happened in my life. My children too, and then they'll leave and your city will be totally destroyed. Now in the natural, what it meant was the Romans are going to come to Jerusalem in AD 70 and they're going to wipe out the city. And they did. And Jesus loved Jerusalem. So he was predicting what was going to happen in the natural, but it's also applying to us personally, right? Peace is within your reach. If you'll just reach your hand up and say, I need help in this area. I tried it on my own. I can't do it. Even as a Christian, there's no shame and admitting that you're still dealing with a problem as a Christian. He's the spirit of truth, right? The Holy Spirit's the spirit of truth. So why can't we just be honest? Paul even said he hadn't arrived. He had been saved a long time. I haven't arrived. God's still working on me. No shame in it, right? The part that really got me, though, was the end here. It says, since you would not recognize God's day of visitation, your day of devastation is coming. <laughs> it's not an open-ended thing. You have to make a decision, right? If you don't stop, the thing is going to kill you. That sin will kill you. If you're having an affair with a married woman, the husband may kill you. I'm not going down that track. Okay, so hold it up to the fire. and I'm going to close just a couple more verses here. So this is what Paul is saying. And now, you know, look around. Isn't this cool church? Naturally, I would say that. But it's so diverse. Just look at the ethnic diversity. Isn't that awesome? It, and this is not an ethnically diverse part of the country where we're, where we're sitting, where the church is right now. But the body of Christ is, is beautiful. We all come from different backgrounds, but we all rally around the same spirit of Jesus. Whether it's white or black or Hispanic or Asian, it's all the same Jesus. It's all the same blood. Now, I know you all wish you were Italian, but you can't. But if you could be, you, you can't be Italian, you could marry one. For those of you that aren't married yet. Pride, <laughs> see, sin. <laughs> but at least you would eat good. Very hard to do keto on the Italian uh, menu. Really hard, man. Oh, I better keep going. 
He said that he was like a master builder. I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now, why I asked you to look around is because this is part of the building, but then this is also a building. So when he's talking now, you have to look at both sides of that coin, right? Building of the church, but then also building of your temple. But he's referring to the temple. It's this new thing at the time. In 1 Corinthians, this is a really secular city, right? Secular culture. Not a lot of Jews that became converted. They didn't really know the word, and they were falling into sin pretty easily. And he's saying, look, I laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now another one is coming, like Apollos in this case, to build on it. But whoever is building on this foundation has to be very careful because no one can lay any other foundation than the one that was already laid, Jesus Christ. That's really good advice, isn't it? You, you avoid all these weird doctrines if you just stay close to Jesus. And that's what Paul is warning them. And then verse 12, anyone who builds on that foundation may use what? A variety of what? Materials. Gold, silver, and jewels is one category or what? Wood, hay, and straw. On the judgment day, the fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. See, you hold up your decisions to the fire. God has the power to strip the sin off our lives. Satan doesn't have one strategy that can work against the Lord if we are willing to hold our decisions up to the fire. But if we don't, then Satan keeps winning these little cheesy games because we just weren't putting enough effort into the decision. We were underestimating the value of how important that decision really was. Judgment Day, the fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. Now, you don't hear a lot about Judgment Day <laughs> these days, do you? It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Now, look, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Read Matthew 25. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And you have to make a decision now. And we should have a burning in our hearts to try to help other people understand that it's not open-ended. There's going to come a day where a decision is going to be made. And it's not too late. You can still change your mind. God has the power to strip the sin off your life. And they're, they're shocked by that, aren't they? Because they know the sin that's in their life. What they don't know is that God has power to strip the sin off their life. So the last one here is, uh, starts with verse 14, because you got the wood, hay, and stubble, and then the gold and the silver that last through the fire. So you could think about your life and say, what part of my structure is being built on wood, hay, and stubble? But if you start deciding to hold up all your decisions to the fire, it'll burn off right there. Anything that's counterfeit, that's wax on that clay, as you hold it up to the fire, he'll keep revealing it to you. Whatever strategy, even as a church leadership in this church, if we're doing something that's yesterday's strategy that's not from today, and we hold it up to the Lord, he'll burn it off and say, don't do that anymore. Just because that used to work doesn't mean that's what I want you to do now. So why don't people do this? It's a lot of work. <laughs> the easy thing to do is just lean on what worked yesterday. But that's not God. He wants you to hold every decision up to that fire. And Paul's saying if the work survives, the builder gets a reward. So after the fire comes, whatever's left is what he wanted you to have all along. So look, there's just some basic disciplines that all of us should be doing. And that's like Tricia said during the offering time. Read your Bible every day. If you want to be like Bill Johnson, don't walk away until he speaks something to you. Start by saying, I'm going to sit here and read until he speaks to me. If you take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, depends. You, you have to decide what, what your discipline is. But the morning is the best time to do it. I can tell you that by far. Do it in the morning. It sets your whole day. It'll change the course of your decisions during the day. If you start by praying in tongues in the morning, reading the Word of God, committing yourself to him and saying, lead me not into temptation today. <laughs> Every time I get in one of those situations, I want to see that hand. Reach it up. I don't want to see that film just being melted off me because your power is too high. When that temptation comes, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be tainted by that thing because you put more strength in me. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss, but the builder will be saved like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. All right. So this puts it in the Christian realm to say you're not losing your salvation over this. But the thing that you were putting your effort into got burned up in the fire because it wasn't from me to begin with. It was your will, not mine. So keep bringing to me. You save so much time and wasted effort, right? Remember what it says in Psalms, unless the Lord builds a house, you're just going to labor in vain. 
So pray first. Ask him what the plan is, and then do it. Amen? Don't you, uh, the builder will be saved, right? And then 16, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? That's interesting, isn't it? All of you together are the temple of God. So we need each other. We need to be in fellowship with each other. Forsake not the assembling together with other believers. Internet's great. Stuff on the web's great. But you need a live body of believers that you're connected to. Right? There's a storehouse where you get fed. There's a place you can bring friends that don't know the Lord. And we'll have an altar call and they'll get saved. And all that sin will get stripped off their life. Right? As opposed to just sitting home and watching something. You could do that. But let that be your supplement and stay connected to a body of believers. But then this also clearly applies to our temple. Right? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit lives in you as well as all of you together are the temple of God and the Spirit of God lives in you corporately. Mm. It's a lot there, isn't it? And I can't do more than I can do, but I'm going to do what I can do. And if each of us looked at it that way, and, you know, in America, Trish kind of alluded to it a little before, there's a political correct attitude that we're all owed something, like an entitlement mindset. And the Lord's like, no, not really. You work on your stuff. You work on your temple. When everybody together in the body of Christ is all working on their temple together, then the corporate mindset, the corporate anointing increases. And all of a sudden, you don't want to just walk by a sinner. You want to tell them the good news about Jesus because you've got a place you can bring them where there's going to be nurture and love and, and they're going to get brought higher in the kingdom. And that sin that's controlling their lives is going to be stripped away. Isn't that awesome? Nobody else but Jesus could do that. So let's stand. And we'll just finish with verse 17 here. Now, the one good thing, uh, kind of sobering, Verse 17, you kind of read it a couple ways. It says, God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. <laughs> Think about how much he loves the church. And if somebody is sowing seeds of dissension or causing a problem in a church, God does not like that because that's his bride. If you're messing with his church, you're messing with his bride. So be really careful about talking bad about churches because if you haven't tried to do a church, it's a whole lot harder than it looks. I can tell you. And just because they don't do it the way you do it doesn't mean that you've been deputized to write, write out tickets. <laughs> you shouldn't go to that church. Blah, blah, blah. Well, all of a sudden, there's no good churches because this person's Joe expert on everything, right? No, you respect God. And just because they do it different than you doesn't mean it's wrong. You work on your stuff. <laughs> I could really go a long time on that. <laughs> Just says, God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. So don't talk bad about the church. That's what he's trying to say. That is the entity against which the gates of hell will not prevail. Against my church, Jesus said. So don't mess with it. For God's temple is holy. And then he says, you are that temple. You, Peter Roselli. You, Trisha Roselli. You individually. But then you, corporately, king of kings. You are the temple. Isn't that awesome? So then the last one just says what I started with. If you can link these three things together, that's what I was really trying to get you to do, is just think about it this way. The power of God is greater than any sin, right? He'll strip it off you, whether it's turning up the heat on the inside or giving you revelation to just defeat that thing. He strips it off. None of Satan's strategies can win, but there's a contingency when our decisions are tested in a fire. You get it? Like, hopefully that light went on a little bit today. The strategies of Satan will work if you're not testing your decision in the fire because you're on autopilot. The devil loves it when you're on autopilot. Your spirit's open and he can come in. No, and that's why you shouldn't get drunk because your spirit man is open and you have no control. And then who knows how many tattoos would have been avoided if people weren't drunk. <laughs> I bet it's 90%. <laughs> I don't know what the number is. Never mind all the other dumb things we did when we were drunk. Life-changing bad things, right? Accidents, whatever. Think about it. If you could just think about Satan's strategy to try to get you out of control of yourself, and you say, no, I'm holding every decision up to the fire of God, and then I believe this is true. God strips sin of its power, and none of Satan's strategies can work when 
you hold your decisions up to the fire. So could you lift your hands for a minute? And we just say, Lord, burn this message in, no pun intended, but burn the message into our hearts because we want that fire on the inside to keep increasing. Everywhere we look, there's a baptism of fire. There's the, the Holy of Holies, and there's a fire on the altar that never goes out. There's the tongues of fire over the apostles in the second chapter of Acts. You just bring it everywhere to show us that your light is there and that when that heat gets turned up, the film of sin just gets melted away off of our lives. And help us see that other picture, Lord, that you're holding your hand out to us. In any situation, regardless of how difficult it may look or impossible or how many times that we've tried something and it didn't work, we say discouragement is broken off of your people today because you are greater than discouragement and that your power will lift us higher. We are the corporate body of Christ and against your church, the gates of hell will not prevail. So I just, I just empower your church, Lord, right now, as we have our hands up, you see who we are today. We want a download from heaven of that anointing that you have individually for each one of us to go out and operate in our gifts. We don't have to be jealous of other people's gifts. You want us operating in ours and staying in that lane where we're most effective, Lord. As we go out this week from this service today, let us see great fruit. 30, 60, 100 fold times return on the investment that we make. We make a decision to hold all our decisions up to you and let, let the fire test it for its authenticity in Jesus' name. Amen. That's a good decision. Can we just stay for one more minute? Just in case there's somebody here that doesn't know the Lord. And if you, if you have friends, you should bring them to church. Amen. Don't worry if they're going to like the music or not. It doesn't matter. The Lord has a way of working with them, right? So this isn't real complicated. It's just a decision that you make in your heart. If you don't know the Lord and something rang true today, it resonated with your heart that this sounds true. There's a lot of people here who would agree with you. It was the best decision that we ever made. So what we do is we just say a prayer. And church, could you pray? If you're a Christian, just there might be somebody here that doesn't know the Lord. Remember how important this decision was in your life? I remember in my life, it felt like my feet were nailed to the floor the day that I was wanting to go up and, and accept the Lord. And I just stepped out of my shoes and said, no, you're not keeping my feet nailed down seeing. But there could be somebody here right now that this is their decision point right now. And they could retreat back into darkness so they could walk into the light. Amen? So pray, church, okay? Pray. Lord, we thank you for that person that's here, that you will give them that insight and that enlightenment open their eyes to see the truth of the word of god all right so let's just say a prayer together if you're that person you could say it with us and we're just giving you an introdu introduction to the lord so heavenly father i come to you in the name of jesus i recognize i fall short i have sin in my life and i need to be saved I can't save myself but jesus can save me oh fully understand it all, but I feel your love today. And I want that love in my life to overcome the power of sin. I turn away from my sin. I repent. I apologize for any way that hurt you, Lord. But I turn to you and I ask you to come in my life to be my Lord and Savior. I accept you, Jesus, today, right now, as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it would be great if anybody said that prayer for the first time. So we're just going to ask, did you? Anybody here say that prayer for the first time? Because we'd like to pray with you, we'd like to give you a Bible, we'd like to help you walk in this new way of living, which is an amazing way of living. Hey, church, you never know, there's people watching online too, right? Somebody in their bedroom could be saying yes right now and by faith let's just give a, a clap for that amen amen it's good news if you're a christian keep a smile on your face it makes people realize there's good news uh do we have prayer today all right so there's prayer if you have some besetting sin that's really been gripping you that you feel like has control over your life god's power is greater amen so allow the Lord to work with that and break that thing off your life and don't leave with the thing that you walked in with. Amen?
So, like I said earlier, we want to give everybody an opportunity. If you've been in a hard place and your heart's been a little um, dry and indifferent towards the Lord, you know, we have a prayer line up here today. We have opportunity. We would love to pray with you uh, just to set you ablaze again. Um, that happens, you know, you go through stuff, disappointment happens, and your heart gets a little hardened. And so God wants to, to reignite you today. So we want to give you that opportunity. Amen.